Hello, uh, welcome to Adventures Among Ideas. So our question today, the big question of the day is, what does it mean to really experience a work of art or to experience any object or event aesthetically as opposed to experiencing it in some other way? Today, I want to try to summarize the answer John Dewey gives in his book, Art as Experience. Um, this is possibly the most important, but also one of the most difficult American writings on aesthetics. So I'm going uh, to first focus on what Dewey himself has to say about his intriguing question. What is this intriguing question of what is aesthetic experience? And in the future, I will discuss some other philosophers who were influenced by Dewey on this point and perhaps other people who were not influenced by Dewey. But right now, my interest is kind of in the pragmatic tradition, the pragmatist tradition of aesthetics. <clears throat> so first of all, right at the beginning, we need to take note of a couple of distinctions that Dewey makes regarding experience. He makes a distinction between experience, or experience at large, experience in general, and an experience. And he makes a distinction between aesthetic experience as such and other kinds of experience, uh, which are sometimes covered by the term practical, but there's other, other terms he uses as well. Uh, practical experiences can have, or other kinds of experiences, can have an aesthetic aspect, an aesthetic quality, but are, they are not primarily aesthetic experiences. It's and it's important to keep these distinctions between experience and an experience uh, and between aesthetic experience and a practical experience in mind. It's going to be, these are our major distinctions for right now. At the same time, it's equally important to realize that all the kinds of experience are continuous with each other. Experiences that uh, experience that obtains a certain form becomes an experience, while an experience that becomes intensified in a certain way becomes an aesthetic experience. Uh, likewise, an aesthetic experience that becomes channeled towards a non-aesthetic end becomes another kind or another mode of experience, while an experience that loses its sense of form through distraction or routine becomes just kind of plain old experience. At one point, Dewey says that an experience rises out of experience like a mountain peak rises out of the earth. The point being here that they're made of the same stuff with experience having a certain form, which raises it above kind of normal uh, experience. So let's look a little more closely at each of these ways of experiencing. So first, experience in general. So experience for Dewey consists of everyday events, doings, and sufferings, as he says. Uh, it comes about, experience comes about, through the interchange or interaction of organism and environment. He says the very processes by which life is maintained tend to throw the organism out of gear with its surroundings. So very processes by which life is maintained, right? So survival processes. And of course, kind of extra stuff that humans add on top of that. Um, experience is the result of this falling out of gear or falling out of step with the environment and the effort to get back into gear or into step with the environment. So experience is the enjoyments and sufferings of the organism as it falls out of step and tries to get back into step with the environment. So a creature gets hungry and searches for food, it feels cold and searches for warmth, it feels lonely and searches for companionship, companionship, and so on and so on. Uh, and so only in what Dewey calls a finished world, in a world without change, in a world without needs, would there be no experience. Experience per se does not necessarily have any clear, uh, any form or clear direction toward fulfillment. So let's say that I'm trying to get some work done, uh, but I feel a bit hungry, so I get up to go to the cupboard, but then my phone buzzes, so I check my messages, and then I remember there was some information I wanted to look up online, but then my son asked me a question about his homework, and then I remember I was hungry, but first I should probably unload the dishwasher, and, you know, this could go on indefinitely. Uh, there's a lot of 
experiential fragments here, you know, bits of experience, but nothing that can be, be said to cohere into an experience in Dewey's sense. So what is an experience? Uh, Dewey gives some examples. So a piece of work is finished in a way that is satisfactory. A problem receives its solution. A game is played through. A situation, whether that of eating a meal, playing a game of chess, carrying on a conversation, writing a book, or taking part in a political campaign, is so rounded out that its close is a consummation and not a cessation. So an experience doesn't just end, doesn't just cease, it concludes or gets consummated. It, as he also says, it runs its course to fulfillment. Uh, these kinds of consummated experiences are individualized or marked off from other experiences. They are self-sufficient in a way that beginning but not completing an activity is not. Um, so not totally self-sufficient, but they're they have a certain kind of self-sufficiency in that they run toward a conclusion, at which point something else begins, a new experience begins. Because of this movement of interrelated parts toward fulfillment, these experiences of playing a game, of solving a problem, have what Dewey calls aesthetic quality. They have an aesthetic quality. They are not aesthetic experiences, per se, for reasons that I'll address in a moment. Yet any experience in which the phases of it build on each other toward consummation, any experience like this attains form and has aesthetic quality. Or in other words, the aesthetic quality of experience is how it builds toward a conclusion or consummation. Uh, so take, for example, two players absorbed in a game. There is a beginning to the game which marks it off from other experiences. While the game is being played, each player is continually responding to the other, drawing on their own past experiences, anticipating the other's actions, and the outcome of the game. Uh, there are enjoyments, there are sufferings, there are actions and reactions, all interrelated with each other by the purpose of, through the purpose of playing the game. This is an integral experience, an experience that has aesthetic quality. On the other hand, experience is devoid of this aesthetic quality when you're forced to do something or have constant distraction like in my, or interruption like in my example, or when a behavior has become so routine that you're no longer aware of what you're doing. The forced labor of a prisoner is generally not aesthetic, I would say. Trying to have a conversation with someone who's constantly checking their phone is probably not aesthetic. Uh, performing the same action on an assembly line for the, uh, the thousandth time that day is not aesthetic. In these situations, the parts of the experience don't build on each other toward a fulfilling conclusion. Uh, the experiences end or transition into other experiences. They kind of stop and start and stop and start maybe, but they don't really conclude. They don't come to a kind of fulfillment or consummation. Now, there are many different kinds of an experience that you can have. The list that Dewey gave earlier gives some indication of this, right? Finishing a piece of work, solving a problem, eating a meal, playing a game, things like that. At a very general level, Dewey tends to distinguish among practical, intellectual, and aesthetic experiences. So practical, intellectual, and aesthetic. And you can maybe just make a broad distinction between practical and, and aesthetic, but it may be useful to also kind of break out aesthetic, uh, sorry, break out uh, intellectual and maybe some others, but um, we're just going to briefly focus on these three just as a way to understand the uh, different kinds of experience. So as an example of a practical activity, think about walking to the store to get groceries. Imagine what that's like. So our experience has a beginning point, a series of things that happen as phases of the experience, and a concluding point. There's kind of a beginning, a middle, and an end, so to speak. We walk out of the door anticipating what's going to happen and desiring a certain outcome. Uh, we meet with circumstances that either help us or hinder us. For example, the street crossing signals are or are not in our favor. The products we want are or are not in stock. The checkout line is or is not slow. And we respond to these circumstances with pleasure or annoyance. Uh, the experience comes to its anticipated conclusion when 
we'd return home with the objects that we needed. So it has its uh, conclusion. So this is an example of a practical experience. An intellectual experience um, is an experience which is mainly about finding out about something. So you can say it's maybe different than practical experience, or maybe it's a specific kind, you know, sub sub category of uh, practical experience. But when you're trying to find out about what something is, or how something is to be used, or how something works, something like that. Uh, we're trying to figure out about something, about some situation, so that we can act appropriately with respect to it. Is that smoke I see over there? Is that from a controlled or an uncontrolled fire? Is this snake down there? Is that a sna venomous snake or is it not? Uh, should this signal that we want to know about, should this be analyzed using, using a Fourier transform or a Laplace transform? Uh, is this concept that we're using, is it conjunctive or disjunctive? Um, performing any kind of analysis like this yields intellectual experience. What I'm doing now, trying to figure out how an aesthetic experience is different from other kinds of experience, this is part of an intellectual experience. So we're having an intellectual experience about aesthetic experience, if that makes sense. Um, in, practic uh, in a practical or intellectual experience, the conclusion of the experience has value on its own account, Dewey says. It's detachable from the experience. Uh, the value of the groceries I buy does not depend on the experience I have buying them, generally speaking. Uh, the groceries can enter into many new relationships with other things and new experiences. Uh, they have kind of their own independent good. Likewise, the results of, say, a financial analysis. The results of the analysis become independent of the experience of arriving at them, and they can become used in other situations. Uh, likewise, with a scientific or philosophical analysis, which should yield a generalization that can be applied in other situations. And this is different from what happens in aesthetic experience. Which is not to say that nothing can be gained from aesthetic experience, but that the distinguishing feature of an aesthetic experience is its kind of self-oriented quality. So aesthetic experience for Dewey might be described as perception for its own sake. We're not trying to get something out of the experience that can help us in other situations. Uh, when we fully experience an aesthetic object, a piece of music, a poem, a painting, a sunset, uh, all of our other activities are integrated into just that experience. Desire, your desires, your thoughts, for example, do not disappear. They don't go away, but they are integrated into the perceptual experience. Our desires and our thoughts find fulfillment in the perception itself, in that perceptual aesthetic experience. So in aesthetic experience, there is no goal beyond the experience itself. Of course, there can be, but that uh, is a, a kind of separate aspect of the experience, right? We're just focusing, focusing on the aesthetic aspect of the aesthetic experience. Um, and this is why aesthetic experience can be, descri be described as disinterested or detached, as some theorists have argued. Um, it's not that we're without desire when we have aesthetic experience, rather our desire just uh, is just the desire for the experience. Our expectations are just expectations about the experience. In having an aesthetic experience, we're not trying to win fame and fortune. We're not trying to make the world a better place. We're not trying to survive another day. Um, and aesthetic experience can contribute indirectly to goals like these, but they're not the goal of the experience. The experience is the goal. The experience, the uh, the goal of aesthetic experience is that experience. An example that often occurs to me in this context is my eating habits. Usually when I eat, even if I'm eating a well-made meal, I have a goal. I kind of have another goal. I'm trying to satiate my hunger. I'm trying to get the meal over with so I can do something else. Uh, in fact, I'm often doing something else while I'm eating. Um, so even if the food is really good, I only kind of half taste it. But once in a while, I'll say to myself, self, slow down, slow down, and really, let's really taste the food this time. Uh, then the experience 
becomes aesthetic, I would say. I focus on just what is there in the food and not on the utilitarian goal of eating to get energy and nutrition for my body. Uh, the experience becomes about what flavors and smells and textures are there, are just there in the food, in that meal. And if there's an interesting side effect to this aesthetic to an aesthetic approach to eating, which is that you don't feel you need to eat as much. And a similar thing happens, I think, with other arts. For example, uh, one person, especially if they're a tourist, may go to a museum with a goal of seeing as many artworks as possible. This is not having an aesthetic experience in the sense that the goal for the tourist is not really to see the artworks, but to be able to say that you saw the artworks. Another person might go to a museum for the same amount of time and really savor just three or four artworks. That's, of course, the nice thing about living close to a major museum. A well-done painting might take an hour to fully experience. And when you're just passing through a place as a tourist, you don't necessarily have the time to have aesthetic experiences. And you don't necessarily need works of art to have aesthetic experiences. You can experience nature in the same way. But in terms of artworks, uh, Dewey says that we really only grasp, fully grasp, a work of art to the extent that we relive what the artist went through in producing the work. Obviously, there are some epistemological difficulties here. How do we know what the artist went through? But I think the broader point is that the viewer or hearer of an artwork um, or reader, whatever, must go through something like what the artist must have gone through, gone through in perceiving certain relations among elements and the uh, cognitive and emotional effects of these relations among the elements in the artwork and how these are put together. Uh, or to use the example of food again, uh, to, to experience a meal aesthetically is to relive the chef's selection process in combining different flavors and textures and smells and to experience these aspects as building toward a satisfying conclusion to the meal. Experiencing an artwork, we can say, uh, is bringing our perception closer to the perception of the artist to try to see reality from his or her perspective, uh, from his or her perspective. And this experience changes us, as does any other experience. So aesthetics experience is not entirely self-contained. It's convenient to kind of think of it that way, but it can lead to what at one point Dewey calls revelation. So he devi defines revelation as the quickened expansion of experience. And this is what he calls art's moral function. Aesthetic experience, like any experience, changes the organism. It changes the experiencer. Aesthetic experience, in particular, it shows us how to experience the world in a new way. So Dewey says, uh, the moral function of art itself is to remove prejudice, do away with the scales that keep the eye from seeing, tear away the veils due to want and custom, perfect the power to perceive. All right, so this in brief form is Dewey's theory of aesthetic experience, as I've been able to summarize it. It is, from the perspective of desire, a self-contained experience of some object, from the experience of our goals. It's a, a self-contained experience of some object. And of course, objects designed for that purpose, artworks work best, but they don't necessarily need to be human-made works of art. Um, and in an aesthetic experience, the elements or phases of the object, its shapes, its textures, its sonorities, and so on, are felt as building and contributing to a unified experience. The consequence of this absorption of our interest and our perception in an object is the consequence of all this is the expansion of our capacity to experience. Okay, so in a future episode, I want to explore how some other philosophers took up Dewey's ideas about aesthetic experience and ran with them. I think this can be a useful thing to do. Dewey's Art as Experience as, uh, is a great book. It's densely packed with insights, but these insights are not always developed or presented in a systematic way. It's kind of, each chapter is kind of everything all at once. And so it's a difficult book to deal with. It's easy to get overwhelmed, at least it is for me. Um, and 
although I don't know if any later work of American aesthetics has attained the richness of art as experience, uh, a number of thinkers who followed Dewey were helpful in clarifying some of his distinctions and building on his distinctions, um, especially as regarding exp uh, aesthetic experience. So I'm going to try to follow up this in a little, some number of <laughs> days or weeks, with an exploration of other thinkers who have uh, followed Dewey in how he thinks about uh, aesthetic experience. But that is all for now, so have a good one and see you later.